So let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, hear us. Christ, graciously hear us. God, the Father of heaven, have mercy on us. God, the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. God, the Holy Ghost, have mercy on us. Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. Holy Mary, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Illustrious Son of David, pray for us. Light of the Patriarchs, pray for us. Spouse of the Mother of God, pray for us. Guardian of the Redeemer, pray for us. Chaste Guardian of the Virgin, pray for us. Foster Father of the Son of God, pray for us. Watchful Defender of Christ, pray for us. Servant of Christ, pray for us. Minister of Salvation, pray for us. Head of the Holy Family, pray for us. Joseph Most Just, pray for us. Joseph Most Chaste, pray for us. Joseph Most Prudent, pray for us. Joseph Most Valiant, pray for us. Joseph Most Obedient, pray for us. Joseph Most Faithful, pray for us. Mirror of Patience, pray for us. Lover of Poverty, pray for us. Model of workmen, pray for us. Glory of domestic life, pray for us. Guardian of virgins, pray for us. Pillar of families, pray for us. Support in difficulties, pray for us. Solace of the afflicted, pray for us. Hope of the sick, pray for us. Patron of exiles, pray for us. Patron of the afflicted, pray for us. Patron of the poor, pray for us. Patron of the dying, pray for us. Terror of demons, pray for us. Protector of Holy Church, pray for us. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, spare us, O Lord. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, graciously hear us, O Lord. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You made him the Lord of his household and prince over all his possessions. Let us pray. God, who in thine ineffable providence did choose blessed Joseph to be the spouse of thy most holy mother, grant that as we venerate him as our protector on earth, we may deserve to have, have, have him as our intercessor in heaven, thou who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So what I would um, like to do and propose to do is to, to talk for about half an hour and then throw it open for your comments and questions. So you might like to jot some ideas down or some questions as we go. Um, if you wish to. So just first of all, can I, can I start? Well, first of all, can I just get up for a moment, turn the heater off? It's warm enough in this room now. It was a bit cool in Tamworth today. So first of all, just a little bit of uh, introduction of myself um, and a little bit of background. Before I went to the seminary, um, I was a teacher in Catholic schools, mainly upper primary, and I spent the great majority of my years as a teacher in a boys' college in Brisbane called Iona College. So most of my teaching life was to do with the education of boys and, and young men, and I carried that through into my years as a priest, and not long after I was ordained, I got involved in young adults ministry in the Archdiocese of Brisbane. And it was while involved in that that I became one of the, um, the founders of the Frassati Fraternity named after Blessed Pier Giorgio Frassati. And I'll speak a little about Pier Giorgio at the end of tonight's talk. 
And that fraternity has spread from Brisbane to Melbourne. And now it's in two places in Sydney, Lewisham and Bondi. So I can identify in myself over the years, my adult years, I've always had a concern and interest in the welfare of boys and young men. And that's continued to this very day. So I'm delighted to be able to be with you and talk to you. And I think the context in which you are young men today is very different from the context that I was back in the 70s and the 80s, because you find yourself in a society today that doesn't really value masculinity, doesn't value femininity either, but it does certainly does not value masculinity and at times calls masculinity toxic. And you're surrounded by messages and slogans that call for feminization of men, as well as an elimination of the beautiful and God-given differences between man and woman. You live too in a time that's bombarded by pornography, whether that's light or sinister. And also our society is somewhat distrustful of anything that men might do together in the sense of brotherhood. So I suppose the main purpose, apart from giving you some information tonight, is to encourage you in your quest and desire to be men and to be authentic Catholic men. So that's what I'd hope to do tonight. So the talk, my presentation has really three components. The first is, is to describe something of where we find ourselves now as men, and then to speak of some of the essential tasks of young manhood, some of the necessary attractions in that time of life, some of the dangerous distractions, and then to finish with uh, a little bit of information about Pietro Giorgio Frassati. So where do we find ourselves today? I could probably relate that quite easily uh, just by telling you the story that surrounds my book, which most of you have heard of and some of you have got and perhaps started to read. The, I began my work for the PhD thesis that was the essence of this book in 20. 11. And I finished it, finished the thesis, and it was approved in mid of 2016, so five years ago. So about 2017, it was ready for publishing, and then it was finally printed and published in 2019. So in that space of time from mid 2016, so five years, 2016, to where we find ourselves in 2021, just let me remind you of what has happened in our society, in Australia, in the area of sexuality. We have seen a so-called debate on the same-sex marriage plebiscite, it being passed, it being established in law. We've seen the entrenchment of programs, most particularly in Victoria and other places called the Safe Schools Program which is part of the explosion of gender ideology and gender fluidity. A person can now change their birth certificate to reflect the sex that a person feels that they are. Abortion up to birth has been legalized around the nation. And we just saw recently in the Olympics that those who have gone through male puberty can now identify as female and compete in women's events in the Olympics. So a lot has happened in five years at a startling rate. And behind all that is an assault on a stable understanding of what it means to be a man, which we will focus on tonight, and a stable understanding of what it means to be a woman. And not only uh, an attack upon that understanding, but a concerted effort to deconstruct the last vestiges of a Christian understanding of the human person. We've witnessed in truth 
sorry, we've, we've witnessed the truth of the statement contained in one of the documents of Vatican II, Lumen Gentium, which says that when God is forgotten, so does the creature forget who he is. When God is eliminated from a society, there's nothing upon which to build our understanding of the human person. So then what becomes the understanding of our humanity belongs not to God, but to those who have the power, or those who have the loudest voice, or those who have the most money, or those who have control of social media. So I propose to you, and I'm sure, I know you agree, that the only best way to understand what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman is to ground the conversation upon God and the truth that God revealed to us through Christ and held by his holy church. So that's the context. It is a bit saddening, but it's a reality and we have to deal with it. So let's put that behind us, so to speak, as the background, and then approach together to understand a little more about young manhood. One of the things that you'll find in my book, in fact, probably the first half of it, doesn't deal with theology at all. It actually deals with the, the social background, the, um, what's happening in other areas of human endeavor, endeavor apart from theology. Now, that's not to say that that has prime of place. Theology has prime of place. God has primary place. But there are things we can learn from other areas of human endeavor that are genuine and that have some truth in them. So part of doing the PhD and part of writing the book was to deal in other areas apart from theology. So one of the books that I came across after doing my own book was this one called Defending Boyhood. It's by a Catholic author called Anthony Esselin. You may have heard of him. You may have read some things that he's written. But this book, he defends boyhood from its attacks in our current society. And it's well worth a read. It's very easy to read and very enlightening too. But one of the most interesting things that I found is how he describes boys. And all of us have been boys some a little more recently than others, but he calls boys animated pieces of humanity. I like that term, animated pieces of humanity. Because you only have to be around boys or to observe them to know that's true, because they're generally more active and more noisy than what their sisters might be. And they seem to bump off each other as they grow up. My observation is that both academic and popular literature in the general area of masculinity is now switching its focus to boyhood, which is an interesting development, which we can go into at another time. But to get back to the task that I want to do with you tonight, boys, as we know, become men. It doesn't happen overnight, and we know it doesn't always happen seamlessly or easily and sometimes not always successfully. As um, Steve Bidolf said in his book, Raising Boys, this is a 1980s book, so it's probably somewhat dated now. He said, you don't just shovel food into your boys and make sure they have clean t-shirts and voila, your boy becomes a man. There are many dangers to, and obstacles to navigate many tasks to be undertaken so that these animated pieces of humanity that are boys journey over sometimes an interesting, sometimes a scary, sometimes a dangerous landscape to become men. So what are the necessary tasks of a young man that lead a boy from the years of adolescence to the years of early manhood? Before I launch into that particularly, let us remember that for 2000 years, our church has called young men to excellence 
and to sacrifice. And this was all properly ordered to the greatest cause of all, and that is eternal salvation. The church, through its engaging boys in serving at the altar, through its orders of consecrated life, through its orders of chivalry, recognized and allowed for the masculine yearning to give oneself to a higher and to a worthy cause. And that's something that boys and young men have to a great degree. Women have it as well, but they have it in a different way. If I could just to, to digress, for women, it's normally directed towards other people. And that's the way that God has made women because the crowning of their femininity will be in motherhood, whether that's biological or spiritual. But the crowning of masculinity is fatherhood, whether that's spiritual or biological. And to be a father means to be prepared to sacrifice, to give yourself for something. So the fact that boys and young men want to give themselves to something that's higher and more worthy than themselves is the beginning of this growth towards fatherhood. So to show you another book, which is very worthwhile, an author called John Eldridge, he's a Christian, not a Catholic. He's written a number of good books on masculinity and this one is called Fathered by God. Again, it's a very easy read. And in this book, in the table of contents, what he basically does is to present seven stages of the masculine journey. It's a good biblical number, seven. And it begins with uh, the first two that I won't talk about tonight, which is early boyhood or uh, preschool up to about towards the end of primary school is he calls it being a true son of a true father. And then boyhood from around about the age of 10 up until say 14, 15, it is to be a beloved son. And then he launches into the three that I will speak about tonight. And he's titled them and their titles are engaging and interesting too. The first one that I'll talk about is the young man as a cowboy. And I'll give you the other two as we come to them. And then after those three, then he goes into the stages of later life, which he calls king, and that's about middle age, and then sage, which is the time of being an elder. So let's begin with this first one, which is the young man as a cowboy. This is the stage of late adolescence. And again, with all stages of development, they're very, the, the ends and beginnings are very fluid. So late adolescence might be something around about 16 for some boys, it might be 17, 18 for others. But one of the things that is defining of this stage in a young man's life is that the boy needs to know that certain things and needs he has to experience if he's going to progress on the way towards manhood. And the first thing he needs to know and experience is that he possesses a genuine strength. Now, you most often see this at boys at this time, it comes out in physical strength, you know, they love sport and games, perhaps even the first experience of going to the gym and building muscles. You might remember what it was like to arm wrestle with one of your friends and to win. So all those demonstrations of physical strength are important. And this is what delights the boy at that time. But he also needs to learn that the physical strength and the inner strength that he has too, is ultimately not to be used for himself, but to be used for others. And he learns this through seeking adventure. And the adventure comes in many forms, and not all of them like the hobbits in The Lord of the Rings, not that sort of grand adventure, although it might be. But adventure, Eldridge says, is basically not to live the selfish life. 
not to live the selfish life. So this entails not living for pleasure, not squandering one's time in front of a screen. It's also to resist what has been called the Peter Pan syndrome. That means wanting to be a boy and never growing up. Adventure in whatever form it takes helps the boy to answer the question that remains significant in every way to him. And it is a question that he asks himself, whether consciously or not, do I have what it takes? Do I have what it takes? And he gets to know that he has what it takes through some sort of trial or real expenditure of effort, proving himself in some way, and also delighting in showing this to others. So he needs to prove that he can master a skill, he can master a task, a difficulty, overcome an obstacle, hold down a job, and all through the application of his own efforts, and also through hard slog and discipline. And it's important in this stage to note the key role of the boy's father. Now the father is important at every stage of life and other father-like figures too. But in this stage, the father needs to affirm his son and assure him that he does have what it takes. And when the father does that, the boy stands taller and his spirit is strengthened. But likewise, if the father denigrates or ignores his son and his efforts, the boy can be stunted, even crushed in his development. And here's the danger. He will begin to look elsewhere for the much needed masculine affirmation. And that can lead down dangerous paths of same-sex attraction. So just to recap about this stage, Eldridge says, that life is hard when the beloved son, which is the stage before this, in the stage of the beloved son, the boy is largely shielded from this reality, but a young man needs to know that life is hard and it won't come to you like mum would give it to you, all soft and warm to your liking with icing. It comes to you more the way that dad makes it happen to you with testing, like on a long hike or trying to get an exhaust manifold in a car replaced. Unless, until a man learns to deal with the fact that life is hard, he will spend his days chasing the wrong things, using all his energies trying to make life comfortable, to make life soft and nice. And that is not the way for a man to spend his life. The next stage is the young man as a warrior. We probably identify these, the years of this stage as post-school. And these years are marked by the realization that there are some things that are worth fighting for in life. Eldridge observes in his book that the modern church, and he says this of the modern Christian church, not just the Catholic church, but Protestants as well, that the modern church has an amnesia about and an aversion to those representations of God as a warrior. We hear in Exodus 15, verse 3, the Lord is a warrior, the Lord is his name. And remember the army of angels that God commands. If there's a, an amnesia about God as a warrior and an aversion to those representations of God as a warrior, then this, this has led, Eldridge says, and I personally agree, to a demasculinization, or to put it another way, a feminization of the church in recent decades. Maybe some of the images of Jesus that were somewhat saccharine and feminine haven't helped. Maybe the zeal that he felt for his father's house when he made a whip of cord and drove the merchants out of the temple is glossed over. Jesus was a man who knew that some things were worth fighting for. Well, so what is it worth fighting for? What's it worth being a warrior for? Well, put simply, whatever is good, whatever is true, whatever is beautiful. And these things need to be protected 
And if they are to be protected, it always usually means a fight. But being a warrior is just not external, it's also internal. So we mustn't forget the inner fight, the spiritual battle. And this is a time when the pernicious evil of pornography becomes one of the battles of the young warrior. True and pure manhood is worth fighting for, but how easily it seems young men today surrender in the battle for chastity and purity. Now the blame's not entirely on them, though they have to be called, called on to fight. There's nothing normal or manly about pornography, whatever its form or source. And one of the most strategic weapons in the inner fight, the spiritual fight, is the sacrament of confession. In that sacrament, the wounded warrior receives healing balm from the king. It's a spiritual balm that's effective and immediately cauterizes the wound, allowing it to heal. And through the grace of the sacrament, the young warrior is given strength to re-enter the battle. But to switch again to the external battles, the young warrior needs to have success in these as well. And these battles might mean membership of associations, of groups, even of political parties that can stem the de-Christianization of society that's happening in our age. And it's not just the young man who will benefit, the groups that he joins, the movements that he works for, the causes that he supports will also gain by having the presence of young men. Again, I say, and you may have seen it yourself, quite often we see young women getting involved in these causes, movements or organisations. Young men need to step up as well. So on an external level, <coughs> I'd encourage you to find one or two causes that you can put your energies into and your zeal towards. Could be pro-life causes, could be anti-euthanasia, could be protection of the family, politics, whatever good cause. But I encourage you to engage in the battle because your time of life is when you're made for it. So excuse me for a moment. And lastly, we as men, no matter what our age, have to be on the watch not to be like the first man, Adam. Remember how he surrendered to some sort of paralysis and passivity when the evil one came to attack his beloved and the human race. We know what happened as a result of that. So just to summarize this, um, this stage by quoting Eldridge again, Eldridge says, the heart of a warrior says, I will not let evil have its way. There are some things that cannot be endured. I've got to do something. The heart of a warrior says, I will put myself on the line. The warrior heart is fierce and brave, ready to confront evil, ready to go into battle. This is the time for a young man to stop saying, why is life so hard? He must take on the hardness as a call to fight, to rise up and to take it on. The young man lear he learns to set his face like flint. So the third stage is now, what I'd like to finish these three stages on, is the young man as a lover. So like all stages of development, the young man cannot truly and effectively arrive at this stage of the lover until he's negotiated the stages before this one that I've just spoken about. If he doesn't, the entry into this stage will be somewhat shallow and even stunted or malformed. It's good to this point also to be reminded that stages successfully negotiated are not dispensed with. We can revisit them or re-enter them when needed. An older man can still have a delight in adventure that a teenager had, but he won't remain there. 
And likewise, an older man can still be a warrior at times, but he won't necessarily remain there. The key, start, key task at this stage for the young man is to realize he must not let the battle become everything in his life. Part of this stage is the actual experience of falling in love with a beautiful young woman. A young woman who, uh, sorry, a young man, probably a young woman too, but a young woman, uh, sorry, said it again, a young man who is head over heels in love is delightful to witness. His world is turned upside down and there's nothing else for him but that beauty. And this is what we call infatuation. And it's meant to be there, it's meant to happen. But eventually it has to mature and hopefully with one young woman, that infatuation will develop into romance and then into love and then into marriage. But equally there must be the attraction to beauty itself. And this is where a young man has, has what's called an aesthetic conversion. He discovers that while the battle is needed, there is another longing within him. Sometimes he doesn't know it. Sometimes he doesn't know what he's longing for. But this can be the time in his life where music and poetry, a film or a book can stir him like it never has before. It's somewhat like his soul is undergoing a second birth. And this awakening to beauty can lead a young man to the heart of God because it is God who first lifts the masculine heart above the mundane and awakens a longing and desire for himself, who is all beauty. It is in this that the young man first experiences what St. Augustine said, our hearts are restless, Lord, until they rest in thee. So apart from discovering, hopefully, a beautiful young woman, this is also the stage of deepening the interior life, the life of the soul, spiritual life. And I suggest that every young Catholic man at some time during this stage should go on retreat. Of course, the style of the retreat has to be manageable. Don't do a 30-day retreat as your first ever retreat. But a weekend retreat where there's some silence, time for personal prayer, communal prayer, and of course, the Holy Mass. But of course, with this spiritual awakening, it's also the time of vocational discernment. And for most young men, this is the discovery of that beautiful one whom he wishes to marry. But equally also for some, it is the discovery of the beauty of God and the thrill of giving one's manhood and one's life to Christ and his church. And it's also the attraction towards the unique beauty of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Becoming the lover, no matter in which direction it takes you, allows for the vista and landscape of real adult masculinity, the chance to open up and blossom. After all, despite what our society may send us, messages in many subtle and not so subtle ways, who wants to remain in youth permanently? Because ultimately becoming the lover becomes life-changing. It becomes an enriching and finding of self that can become then the act of giving oneself away as a gift. And it's only in making a gift of himself that a man finds his true identity. And to end the description of this stage, I won't quote from Eldridge, but from Pope Benedict XVI in his wonderful encyclical Deus Caritas Est. Pope Benedict wrote, love looks to the eternal. Love is indeed ecstasy, not in the sense of a moment of intoxication, but rather as a journey as an ongoing exodus out of the closed, inward-looking self towards its liberation through self-giving, towards authentic self-discovery, and indeed the discovery of God.
Just one other reference to my book uh, before I finish with a few words about Pietro Giorgio Frassati. In my book on page 89, it's in a, in a section titled Mythopoetics. And I speak about another book that is worth reading if you want to take it up. It's a book called Iron John by Robert Bly. Now, while it's useful, um, I'd also just caution not, not to put too much um, weight on it because part of the way that Robert Bly has written is based upon the psychology of Carl Jung. And I, I think that Jung's psychology is very, um, very shallow and somewhat dangerous towards Christianity. But however, Robert Bly has written an interesting allegory of the journey of the masculine. And I won't go into it any more than that, but if you want to, Pick it up. You may not want to buy it, borrow it from the library, or you might even find it on a, an e version. It's quite a, a good read. And if, if you remember some of the things that I've said tonight, it brings that nicely um, into the story as well. The other thing in my book at the end, in what I've called the afterword, I propose three male saints. Saint Joseph, Blessed Pietro Giorgio Frassati, and Saint Francisco Marto. And there's others I could have put in, but I just went for three in the book. Three male saints that I propose to all men who can be like our spiritual brothers or our spiritual father in the case of Saint Joseph. Because let's be honest, we all need heavenly intercessors on this journey of life. And we also need constant male companions. We need male companions to be brothers that we can see and talk to like you are to each other. But also we need those male companions who have walked this pathway of life and have made it to heaven. And Pier Giorgio is one of those remarkable young men. I first sort of met him, if you like, when uh, World Youth Day was in Sydney in 2008 and his body was brought to Sydney, his body is incorrupt, which is a great sign of God's approval and, and also usually a great sign of purity and chastity in life. And since I first met him, I've, I've fell in love with him and I've got countless books on him. And that's why we chose him as our patron when we began the Frasati fraternity. So let me just briefly tell you four things about him that I propose to you as four solid pillars on which to build your young, your life as a young man and your growth into uh, maturity and vocational discernment. The first one is a sacramental life. You are fortunate to be Catholic young men and to have access to the sacraments. Pier Giorgio went to daily mass from about the age of 12 or 13. It was quite uncommon, even in very Catholic Italy of the early part of the 20th century. By the way, he died when he was very young. He died at the age of 24, the same age as St. Therese of Lisieux. And I think, no, not St. Bernadette, she was 35. Um, anyway, it was quite uncommon because uh, it, while well, Italy was very culturally Catholic. There were many who sometimes didn't go to mass except Christmas and Easter. In fact, Pier Giorgio's father, he never saw his father go to mass. And his mother went to mass every Sunday, but he never saw her go to Holy Communion. So he went to daily mass and daily Holy Communion from about the time he was 12 or 13. <clears throat> and he went to regular confession as well. And his life was subordinated to those things. He was a great sportsman, a great skier and mountain climber. And with his friends, when he would go into the mountains on weekend trips, he would always make sure that there was the possibility to go to Sunday mass. 
And if there wasn't where they were going, sometimes he would, he came from a very wealthy family, he would sort of pay the expenses of a priest to come with them so that he would say mass for them on Sunday. And if he couldn't do that, he wouldn't go himself. He wouldn't miss Sunday mass. The second pillar is a life of charity. Now in Pier Giorgio's life, this took the form of being a member of the St. Vincent de Paul and serving the, uh, the poor who lived in the slums of Turin where he grew up and lived. And Turin was a big industrial town and many had flocked to the country, from the countryside to work in the factories and they were paid low wages and they lived in awful conditions. By the time that Pier Giorgio was 21, he personally, from his own money, was supporting 120 families that he visited and supported, buying food for them, buying medicine for them, buying clothes for the children so they could be properly dressed for their first Holy Communion and so on. The third pillar is chastity. After he died, the priests who knew him gave evidence in our gathering, evidence for his cause for beatification. They gave evidence that he was always pure and chaste. So in other words, they, without going into details and breaking the seal of confession, they were hinting that he must never have confessed a mortal sin against purity or chastity. That makes him a wonderful guide and support as we struggle in purity and chastity. The fourth pillar is what I've called authenticity. Pier Giorgio was one of those unique people to his friends and even to strangers and acquaintances. They sense something about him even if they couldn't put words to it. So when they saw him sitting on the tram going around to re reading his prayer book, they didn't throw off at him. When they saw him go to confession, even to a priest out in the open, they thought that was unusual, but it just seemed right for who he was. And this is one of the stories I love about him. He was a good sportsman, not only in outdoors, but indoors. He was very good at billiards, snooker. And he'd often play that in the evening with his friends. And he would bet with them that if he won the game, they had to come with him to Eucharistic Adoration. And he won the bet more often than he lost. So off they'd go with him to adoration. And usually they'd fall asleep, but he'd stay awake. And they didn't rib him about it, throw off at him. They just said, okay, you won, Pier Georgia, we'll go. <laughs> so a sacramental life, a life of charity, pursuit of chastity and purity and authenticity. So just to conclude, St. Ambrose, who brought Augustine into the church, is reportedly to have said to the young St. Augustine before he was baptized, before Augustine was baptized, Ambrose said, Augustine, only the truth will turn you into a man. Only the truth will turn you into a man. And the truth is certainly a collection of ideas. It's a philosophy. It's a sense of logical statements. It's a statement of our beliefs. It's living in line with our faith and also human reason. It's an experience of personal integrity. It's all of those things. But at the very foundation, truth is a person. It's God who became man, Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. So the closer you come to Jesus, the more you conform yourself to him, the more of a man you will be. And that, coming close to Jesus and conforming yourself to him, is the journey for the whole of our life whether you're a boy, a young man, or an older man. 
So Christ is the pathway and Christ is the end of this journey of life as a man and heaven is our homeland. So to use the name of your group and the name of my book, I encourage you, Esther Via, be a man. And don't be fearful and don't be apologetic for being a man. So I think I took a little longer than I expected, but I thank you for, for listening. So now it's over to you. Thank you very much, Father. I don't think anyone was complaining in that time. Don't worry. <laughs> thank you. Um, I like it how you did things in three as well. Good number. <laughs> um, yeah, does anyone have any questions off the top of their head? I can get us started off if you'd like. Okay. Um, I'll just dive straight in. I was thinking because I'm 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 hoping to be married shortly, and so I'm thinking about future kids. Hopefully, God willing. And um, so I, I was wondering, in terms of uh, control over your young boys, of what. Uh, what's coming in their life and what's not because um, there's obviously really big threats out these uh, threats out there these days that have mm. expanded a lot so b basically honing in on pornography um, how do you think like what's a good way to go about controlling that without being over controlling and sort of uh, causing your boys to spite you and um hide things from you like um I'm, I'm trying to wonder where you start with that I'm, I'm guessing it's just to form a loving relationship but how, how far can you go um saving him from that because there's so many worldly outward things that can come in on the family life it's not funny so if you could comment on that that'd be great well as you said sean it begins having a, some sort of success or great success with that task begins way back in the boy's life. And so it is ultimately your, the father's relationship with his son. That's the important thing. And um, sorry, Sean, you might need to take back being a host because sure. Benjamin Frasco has entered the waiting room. Could I admit him now? Or? Oh, yes, please, actually. Okay. Actually, you're up to you. <laughs> All right. You take back being host now. Um, um, yeah. Could you, I think. Do I have to do something? Uh, yes. Can you please hover above my picture where there's three dots in the blue? Okay. And make you the host. Please. Done. Thanks for letting me back in. <laughs> Oh, good. I'm, I'm just uh, Ben. I'm just answering a question from Sean about how um, each of you, maybe as a pr prospective father, or how a father can protect his boys, most particularly from um, pornography and um, internet problems. Great so, question. I, I just began by saying it does begin, and Sean said it himself. It begins right back with the relationship that the father develops with the son. And there has to be that, um, that love and intimacy between father and son established in the early years, particularly at that time where, which is normally around about five or six, when um, the influence of the mother needs to necessarily decline because the, the boy is becoming a boy, not a toddler anymore. So it's usually from that age that the father needs to be regularly and intimately involved in his son's life. And I, th and I use that word intimacy um, purposefully because it's not just a, a means of being close to, but rather it's actually a, a trust between the father and the son that and from the father's perspective, it comes from giving him those messages of he is the beloved son and he does have what it takes to be 
a good boy or a man, and that the father is proud of him and that the father delights in him, exactly what God the Father said to God the Son at the, his baptism and transfiguration. So the father needs to go those messages to his son, and that builds up a very trusting relationship that then when the boy wants to talk about things or when he has a problem, there's a greater likelihood that the boy will open up to his father. I'm not sure at what stage, this is something that um, I don't think we can give a definite age to, but part of the father's role of guardianship is just, you know, keeping an eye on what's happening in the boy's life and who he's mixing with and just listening to things the boy might say so that he might pick up what influences outside the home that the boy is being exposed to. And at some point, the father needs to have to begin that conversation about sexuality and sex. Um, and, you know, that, that can sort of start in small ways, even from um, the age of six, seven or eight, you know, as the, as the boy, boy starts to grow and, you know, maybe he's getting um, stronger in his legs or stronger in his arms and the father just acknowledges that and, you know, says, look at your muscles, how they're growing. So those sort of comments about the body can actually create a background that leads some point in the future to eventually easily talk about sex and sexuality. And then the other part too, as you know, is to, to use some of those, um, what do they call them? Those um, internet protecting programs, you know, um, like Covenant Eyes, that's the one I was trying to think of, that actually keeps um, tabs on what children are looking at. But also, I think you have, despite what might happen in other families, you have to be very careful about how many devices are in your home. Um, I really can't see the point, maybe I'm old fashioned, I really can't see the point of children having TVs in their bedrooms. Um, and then when it comes to devices like uh, laptops, iPads, tablets, phones, um, I'll just give you an example. My, my nephew and his wife have four children. They range in age from 15 down to five, two girls, a boy, and then a girl. And while there is a, 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 there are two laptops in the house, but one is solely for the use of the eldest because she's being homeschooled. The other three can't use it. The other laptop is for Pilar, that's Joseph's wife's name. That's her work laptop. The children are not allowed to touch it or use it. And the only devices left are two mobile phones. One belongs to Joe, one belongs to Pilar. Now the children are able to use them, but because they belong to their parents, the parents at any time just come, come along and say, you've had enough time on that, give me back my phone. So the phone doesn't belong to the child, belongs to the parents. So there's, you know, something like that that can work well. So Sean, that's a long answer, but um, I hope that's helpful. Is there anything more you wanted to say about that? Or yeah, ask? That, that was brilliant. And you, you got me reminded of, because Tiana and I have, and my fiance have talked about this type of stuff. And um, I, I personally haven't had a TV since I've left home and think it's great. Um, and Tiana doesn't like TV anyway, and it's usually, it's usually just full of garbage, and you don't really want to listen to the news at the moment. Mm -hmm. So to be honest, we, we're hoping to just grow up in a household, well, our kids grow up in a household without a TV. Um, we will still have laptops and stuff, but you don't think that would be overkill, would you, to think that we're depriving them of something that they're, maybe their peers have and things like that you think you think doing something like that is fair yes i do and if that's a decision you make for your family i mean at some point in the future you may change that because you might want to get a bigger screen to watch movies with them 
So that's fine. But you know, if you start like that and mm. just see how it goes, you know, and I don't mean that's not a good expression, see how it goes, but it's a it's a worthwhile start way to start because you're being intentional about it. Mm -hmm. And who knows, by the time your children are 10 or 12, there could be another technology we haven't thought about. Very true. You chip in a wall and the wall becomes the TV screen. <laughs> Something like that, yes. So I've got a question. I apologize, I may have missed it because um, I had to go for a, a group project meeting. So if you've already covered, covered this, just disregard it. Um, <clears throat> but as future fathers, like how can we ensure that our family, um, I guess maybe not ensure, but what would your approach be to um, trying to properly catechize your family and um, giving your children the highest likelihood that they'll come back to, or I guess they'll stay in the faith when they leave the house and when and they're in their 20s and 30s? Because, and, and I guess you hear a lot of people say, oh, I grew up in a really strict religious household. And um, and so now I'm not practicing anymore. That's something like to that effect. Mm. Um, so I guess, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I have three thoughts. The first one is that there is no recipe for 100% success. And I don't mean that to be pessimistic. Uh, I say that because we have to be honest and recognize the existence of free will. And so there are always going to be people in the history of the human race who will walk away from Christ, as we'll hear in this Sunday's Gospel. So yes, it is a great sadness that um, sometimes when young people have grown up in Catholic households and Catholic families, gone to Catholic schools, do not practice the faith and walk away from it. However, that being said, there, I think there are two strong ways in which you can do, make sure that you, you do the best that you can. And can I say there's three? I just thought of another one. And the, the third one is, is obvious. You will pray for your children. That's the most obvious thing. But the other two um, are, are, well, prayer is ongoing too, but these are other, the other two are strategies rather than a continual way of life in terms of prayer for your children. The first one is, I'm not sure whether you're aware of it, but there has been empirical research done that shows that when, and this is across Christian churches, not just Catholic churches, when the father practices his faith, and let's use our Catholic terminology, when the father goes to mass on Sunday, and takes his children and his wife with him, there is a 75 or 75% of children who experience that will go on to practice their faith. If the father doesn't, and it's only the mother who does it, it is only 2%. So the father has an extraordinary impact on the faith life of his children. Now, the and this is another topic for another day, perhaps. The, the absence of men in our church has contributed, it's one of the contributing factors to the fact that young people walk away from the church. I mean, the very fact that the men aren't there means maybe they've walked away as well. But if we're going to ensure that our young people are going to remain committed to the faith and practice the faith and therefore use the means that Christ has given us to get to heaven, we need their fathers there. So that's the first thing. As fathers, you have to take the lead. You don't let your wife, sorry, you, you want your wife to be with you in that but she is not the one who drives it. You have to drive it. You have to be the director. You are the one who has to respond to whatever complaints your child might have or set up processes, even if it's, you know, they behave well at mass 
you go to McDonald's on the way back and get a milkshake or something like that. You're the one who has to put all those things into place. So it's the father who has to give the example. The, uh, the, the other thing is for catechizing your children, don't leave it to the Catholic school. Even if you sent your children to good Catholic schools, or even if you homeschool them, take time to teach them the faith at home. And you might do that in a focused way by sitting down and, you know, going through the catechism with them. But you'll do it by praying with them at home. You'll do it by reading the lives of the saints. Um, when children begin to read or want to be read to, read lives of the saints to them. Um, and then have good Catholic books in your home. And make, you know, have a crucifix in, it, in, in your home and have pictures of the saints. So build up a... Catholic atmosphere in your home. And if you do all those things, it won't become, well, it'll have to be at times saying, no, the rule is that we do this. But most of the time, it will be simply the child absorbs, this is the way our family is. This is the way we lived together. This is just what we do. So therefore, it becomes part of them. It's not a imposition from the outside, but rather something that builds within them. Thanks, Ben. That was a good question. Thank you. Um, I also had another question. Um, thank you, Father, for your wonderful talk. Uh, my question was in regards to vocations. Um, so what are some steps that uh, we as men can take into discerning marriage or priesthood? And what if we, the second part to that question is, what if we found both marriage and the priesthood attractive? How would you discern between the two? To answer the uh, second part first, if a young man was in the seminary and came even to ordination and never thought of the possibility of being married, I would just ask him, why haven't you? Because for, for, for you as young men, well, there are always decisions in life, aren't they? Sometimes they're career decisions. Sometimes they're other much more lower level decisions. But when it comes to vocation, a true choice is always saying yes to one thing, which of itself means a no to something else. So if a young man is going to say yes to priesthood, he has to have a real sense that God is not calling him to marriage. And if a young man is going to say yes to marriage, he has to have a fairly secure feeling within his soul that God is not calling him to priesthood. Now, the reason I say why you need at some point to have an attraction to both, but ultimately make a decision, is that in both those vocations, you are going to be a father. And if a young man comes to priesthood without that notion of fatherhood and a fulfillment of his masculinity, a crowning of his masculinity, as St. John Paul II calls it, in fatherhood, he's going to have a sterile priesthood. And likewise, if a young man comes to marriage and does not admit of fatherhood, that's a sterile fatherhood. And it's sterile in the biological sense as well, because he's probably going to do everything he can not to become a father, but still have the enjoyment of sex. So it's going to bring in contraception and all those other things. So it's very important that um, after a certain time, you have to have a sense that you're going towards one. And then there comes a time where you decide that's the one. And that brings me to the answer the first part of your question, which is, what are the steps you have to take? Well, they are, first of all, a, a very strong sacramental life, because if you have the graces of the sacrament, sacraments, mass, holy communion, confession, you are going to be assisted in your discernment. And then the other thing that you need is prayer. You should pray regularly that you will hear the voice 
of Jesus calling you to the discernment that he, to the vocation he wants. And then thirdly, you need to have some trusted people that you can talk about it with. Thanks, Carl. That was a good question. Thank you for that, Father. Father, I have a question. Yes, that's it. So you described you described fatherhood specifically as um, a willingness to sacrifice, yeah. which in turn is is the culmination of masculinity. So we can say that that's a very masculine attribute: is the willingness to sacrifice. Now, because I am new to Catholicism and I am new to my faith, I feel stunted. Recently, in these last couple of years, I've made some very strong changes in my life, positive changes. Um, and I've worked towards developing a better understanding of what it means to be a man in the true sense of the word. But I want to know what your advice is for someone like me who wants to cultivate a greater willingness to sacrifice. For me, that is a difficult thing. And for me, basically my entire life, I've been doing things out of self-centeredness, out of uh, hedonistic desires. So sacrifice is not something that, that comes naturally to me, nor is it familiar to me. I want to know how to cultivate this more and remove fear from my heart. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Hudson. I'm not sure whether you, well, how many of you, Hudson, you may not be familiar with it because you're uh, new to the Catholic faith, but you might be. There is a very old book called The Imitation of Christ. <laughs> okay, you know. We have a reading group on Monday. <laughs> okay. Um, well, the imitation of Christ gives us, gives all of us, no matter whether we're male or female or whatever age or whatever vocation, an effective, um, I call it an effective battle plan or an effective spiritual plan. And it is something that we need to be doing all through our life, sometimes in different um, dimensions, sometimes in different depths. But it teaches us that we have to develop an indifference and a detachment from the world. And then it says, foster in yourself a love of discipline and practice each day some denial of self. So it's particularly that last one, but the other two are needed as well because I don't think we can deny ourselves unless we have somewhat of a, a love of discipline and a detachment from the world. So it's part of our wonderful Catholic tradition to practice penance and mortification. And the church calls us to do that every Friday in honor of our Lord's death. And then of course, it calls us to do it in a, a greater way, more intense way in the season of Lent. So the beginning of developing the desire to sacrifice oneself and the, then the capacity to actually do it begins with those daily acts of self-denial. And they don't need to be um, enormous. They don't even need to be um, obvious. They can be simple things like if you like a spoon of sugar in your coffee, you don't have it on one day. You just deny yourself and you say, this is so that I can practice denial of self and so that I can learn to have dominion over my own desires. And that will lead also to a a greater capacity to resist temptation as well, particularly in the area of purity and chastity. Um, and I think that's why it's particularly the mark of a man to sacrifice, 
is because until you have reached some maturity in detachment from the world and a love of discipline and a denial of self, then um, you won't be ready to sacrifice. And a thought just popped into my head. Um, remember those, um, the sort of training that happens in the military. You know, they go into boot camp and they actually get broken down and they do awful things, but so that they can be made up again into soldiers who would be prepared to actually give their life in battle. So the boot camp and the military are using what the Christian church has known for centuries, but in a slightly different way. So that those daily acts of self-denial are a bit like spiritual boot camp. So they will be ready for those big battles. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you, Father. Awesome. That was extremely insightful. I think Darwin has a question now. Good. Um, uh, you mentioned about sports and gyms and uh, how you can cultivate like discipline in those pursuits. Um, ever since the lockdown, I've, I've been feeling, I don't know, less of a man in a way. I don't have access to that outlet anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering how I could jump back up uh, during the lockdown. Well, I first of all, I'm I, not surprised that you feel that way because as a young man, you, you do need to have that sense of physical strength. And it is the time of life where yeah, you like to, you need to go on long runs, or if you're not not a runner, you need to, you know, get on the football field and play the game. Um, and it's necessary. It's not only necessary for your health, but it's also necessary for your sense of well-being. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I I hear what you're saying. If I can just use that overworked phrase, um, and it is real. So, you have to find ways in which you can get that physical, um, that physical burst and also expend that physical energy. I, I mean, my, my years as a teacher, I can give you an example, and this is with boys rather than young men, you know, boys around the age of 10, often if you could just sense that they were flagging in some way in the classroom, you just take them outside, make them run around the oval for three times and then take them back in they could learn so easily. So it's, it's necessary for us as men to, to get the body working because then the mind works and then the, the soul is at peace as well. So I don't know how you can do that in terms of where you are and, and lockdown, but, um, but keep, keep on it, keep finding ways in which you can keep active and, and keep strong because it is very important for you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Thank Tom. you. Good question. Well, I, I've got one other question if nobody else has got anything. <clears throat> Again, if you covered this, just ignore it because I can go back and watch the recording. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but I guess if there were a couple key pieces of advice that you had for guys in the early 20s, or late teens, um, what, what would you say, like in today's age, um, I guess that could be generally or in relation to university campuses um, where Christianity or Catholicism are being less and less accepted? Um, I guess, what would you say? I, I suppose I did cover it a little in the talk, so you will hear some answers to it, but not specifically. Um, in terms of being on uh, university campuses, I, I think you, these are a couple of suggestions that probably could be other, other ways others may think of as well. But you do need to find that, um, that support that comes from other young Catholics, but particularly other young Catholic men. Um, one, one of the strengths of femininity is how easily they form networks and how easily those networks become support systems. Now, we as men, and this is not a weakness, I'm not saying it's our weakness, 
that we're just wired differently. We just do things differently. We as men, um, probably because we we like that sense of the battle and we like that sense of war being a warrior and, um, you know, give me my sword and my shield and I'll go out and conquer the world and change it. Um, we sometimes try to do things on our own. <clears throat> and I read somewhere, I can't remember who, who said it or where I read it, but that's often, um, the devil knows that. And so the devil will often pick off the lone warrior. Um, if he's surrounded by other uh, brothers around him, uh, the devil's got a hunger, harder task to actually get him off track. So I think that's really important to find a group of young men that they may be on the campus with you, but they may not, but find other young men who can be your brothers and who you can look to just to be with, because that will be helpful for you, just to hang out and do things together, to pray together, to go to mass together. And then if you want to talk about things, to actually talk about some of the issues. So I think that's very important. Um, I'll just leave it at that because I think you'll find some other things if you listen to the talk that might sort of tag on to that as well. Oh, that's perfect. Thank you. Thanks, ben. Uh, I've got a question. Hello, ben. Um, so it's sort of regarding um, evangelization. Like a lot of men in the world, I think it's it's hard for them to see it appealing to be like a man of God or to give up like sexual pleasure or like other sinful desires they might have. And so how do you make it seem appealing to like maybe push them to change that lifestyle or bring that up to them or even for women? Because I feel like the default view of women is sort of to maybe find a career and focus on that in your 20s and then sort of maybe have one or two kids in your 30s or even 40s and so how do you show people that um it's sort of more like make it sound more appealing for them to do this catholic lifestyle or like focus more on what's important yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a really good question ben and it um it's a it's a question that i suspect we will have to keep on finding answers to. Firstly, I'd say take some consolation and some encouragement from our Lord himself. He who, was, who is the Son of God, perfect in every way, omnipotent in every way, didn't have a 100% track record. He lost one of the 12. So we're not going to always succeed. And secondly, we as an individual person or even the group that's just here together now cannot change the world. We just do our part to fit into God's awesome plan to convert the world. And even God knows that that won't be 100% successful. And as our Lord told St. Margaret Mary and um, a few other visionaries, that his sacred heart grieves over that. He doesn't just shake his head and say, well, oh, well, that didn't work with them, so let's let him go. So we can't convert the world and you can't convert everybody that you may come across. And you can't answer all the erroneous, false and um, misleading and dangerous ideas that you'll come across in society. So what you can do, though, is first of all, be an authentic Catholic man. So strive for authenticity yourself. It's, it's, a, it's going to be a prudential decision. That means you make a decision in the circumstances. There, in other words, there's no one way to, uh, there's no one plan or one answer. But do things, act in certain ways, say certain things where people will know that you are Catholic. Um, 
it could be wearing a scapula, which I think I see you've got on, or a medal. Good, or a crucifix, whatever. Oh, miraculous medal, good. Um, it could be when you sit down at a cafe to have coffee and something to eat or a meal. Even if you're on your own, you make the sign of the cross and you say a grace before meals, even if the grace is said silently. Um, there are many ways in which you can do that because authenticity in a person will eventually attract others. For some, it will be an attraction that will cause them to ask questions and then the answers that they give, may not, they may not like and therefore they attack, but at least they've asked the question. And in some, it will be an attraction that asks, that, that causes them to ask questions. It comes from a place meaning, I want to be like that. So, um, that's some ideas, but uh, that was an excellent question, Ben, because I think it really sums up, it sums up evangelization, but also sums up our life as Catholics too. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I don't, I don't want to keep you too late, Father, but I've, I've got one more question and I think okay. we'll wrap up after that. Um, I, like, you know, I was in the seminary before and now I'm going into married life. Uh, I still love the idea of giving my life to the church in whatever way God wants. Um, I, I wanted to ask if you knew much about third, uh, third right orders and if, because yeah. um, they don't really pop up anymore. Do you think that there should be a revive in this area that... Um, husbands and wives should be actually becoming third right Dominicans or Franciscans and things like that. Do you think that's, um, should, should that be ramping back up at this stage? Do you think? I think it would be a worthy thing to happen. Yes. Um, I would probably um, just advise to, well, well, there's, there's two, Two third orders that I'd probably say are worthy of looking at, only because in some of the other third orders, the to put it um, charitably, the life of the church in the last 50 years has infiltrated into them. So I don't think they're as solidly spiritual or as solidly authentic in their Catholic um, spirituality is what they were. Um, the Car Third Order Carmelites are, from people that I've met who are Third Order Carmelites, and you don't come across them very often these days, but the Third Order Dominicans, um, I think are also, particularly if they're attached to one of the, the newer branches of the Dominican order, like the Dominican sisters that are in Sydney and in um, Gadmain in the Wagga Diocese. Um, the Dominican friars that I've met, particularly the younger ones, are, are very good, strong um, young men. So I think that perhaps the Dominican order in the male order is having a revival. So yes, sorry, I babble on. Um, it, it is a good idea, yes. Oh, um, the other thing, though, that I see happening amongst um, young Catholic adults and young Catholic families is uh, an attachment to the, the more ancient use of the Mass, the 1962 Missal, and the, and the groups and the parish life that come with that, which usually provides some sort of strong... Um, social life that is geared towards the faith as well as strong catechetics for the children so um yeah yeah well that, that, that's what i was going to ask um the third order carmelites you mentioned are they attached to the old right no probably not uh, not the ones that i would be aware of at the moment 
there is a um, there's a new Carmelite convent in the Wilcannia Forbes Diocese, which is um, mm. the old, old Rite Mass, the older Mass. Um, so that might come. Yeah. Okay. So sorry. Um, excuse my ignorance. Um, I have a very cursory understanding of what a third order um, anything is. I, I understand in, you're in some way attached to the religious order, but I don't really understand what that entails. Okay. Well, briefly, historically, uh, the orders that have been around for centuries, like the, the Benedictines, the Dominicans, the Franciscans, and the Carmelites, have usually began with the foundation of a male order, so the friars or the monks, and then the founder, like let's take the Dominicans. Then St. Dominic also founded an order for women. So that was the second order. And the third order are for lay people. So they're, they're not, um, the lay people live their lives in the world, but they follow some of the practices of the, of the Dominican order. And they're attached to the, the friars or the nuns who give them support as well. Thank you. You're welcome, Ben. Thank you very much, Father. You're welcome, Sean. Thank you for inviting me. And it's been a very enjoyable evening and uh, such great questions. Uh, it was it was very fruitful. We, we greatly appreciate it. Um, I, I'm not going to ask anyone. I think we can agree that we um, will do a decade of the rosary for you now, if that's all right. Yeah. Thank you, your spiritual father. Lord. Thank we'll you. Thank our lady for you. Excellent. If you could respond, that would be great, Father. Okay. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We we'll offer up the fifth joyful mystery. When Joseph and Mary found the child Jesus in the temple. Let's remember the gratefulness that God provides in times of anxiety and sorrow. And thank you for our priests, especially Father Paul Chandler. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. 
Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell. And lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Blessed Giorgio Frassati, pray for us. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Well, that was great. Thank you guys so much. And it was I enjoyed it and God bless you all. And hope we meet again sometime. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, Father. It's such you. a rewarding thank evening. Thank you, Father. Thank you, John. Good. Thank you very much. Okay. God bless.